Uh, welcome everyone to Drisha's uh, full program, uh, spring program, what am I saying? Okay, welcome to a uh, full program for Drisha and the third and final class in this series on exploring the philosophy of halakha with Rabbi Dr. Liebens. We encourage you to ask questions either by unmuting yourself or by putting questions in the chat on Zoom or as a comment on Facebook if you're watching us live. And we value everyone's active participation. Uh, so without delay, I'll turn this uh, to Dr. Liebens. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you again. You'll notice from the very first slide, oh, excuse me, Evie, would you mind giving me um, hosting privileges? There we go, so I can share my screen. And you'll notice from the first slide, it's uh, there's an inaccuracy on the very first slide. It says class two, when really this is class three. But we've taken so long over the material that was meant to be class one, that I'm, I'm afraid to say that uh, class three We'll have to wait for another time. In class three, we were going to uh, investigate the question, to what extent the halachic process, when it comes to arbitrating conflict, two people have a legal conflict, to what extent is the halachic process interested in discovering truth? And to what extent is it is it more interested in merely coming to an equitable solution? Um, and those two, those two, um, goals, those two aims can come apart quite far. I was going to start that discussion of class three with the famous story of Solomon, Solomon the wise, and the, uh, and the two uh, women claiming to be mothers of, of a baby that was still alive. Um, uh, ha one baby having died uh, just before, and famously Solomon uh, says, oh, I know what to do. I'll, I'll cut the baby in half. I'll cut the baby in two, and you can each have half. And one, one woman said, yep, that seems like a fair, uh, a fair thing to do. And the other woman says, no, don't do that. I'd rather you gave the baby to the other woman than, than cut it in half. And, and, and Solomon decided that that woman must have been the true mother. We were going to investigate that text. Um, did Solomon really discover the truth? And was the discovery of the truth really the most important thing in that uh, situation? Um, and people with some rabbinic education will know that uh, there's a mission. Obviously he picked the better mother. Exactly, he just picked the better mother. It, it, you know, might not have been the yeah, biological it, mother. Never irrelevant know. for the good of that child. Exactly, exactly. So the, the function of the judge there was to come to the best ruling, not necessarily what was truest in, in some sense or other. Um, and people will, will know that um, there's a famous Mishnah in which two people come to the court, each one holding a talit, uh, a, you know, a cloth, a piece of cloth. Um, and each one says, this cloth belongs to me and not the other guy, but they're both holding it. And the Mishnah suggests in such a case to cut the cloth in two, uh, which, is, which is clearly, a, a, you know, um, is reminiscent of Solomon's ruling. So that would have been class three, we'd have been talking about, um, what the judges in such cases are looking to achieve, truth or justice, and how those two things come apart, another time. Uh, class two, we didn't, we didn't get far enough into, and that's why, that's why there's this inaccuracy on our slide. Um, the question we're looking at, you don't see me on the screen. Somebody doesn't see me no, on the screen, does anyone No, I don't see you, I see Evie. I don't see oh, you. Evie, else, oh, sorry, Evie, you have to pin me. Although, I mean, it's very nice to look at Evie, uh, probably much nicer than, than looking at me, but, you know. Uh, always okay. has a smile. She, she always You're has a smile now. on her face. She always has a smile on her face, Evie <laughs> does. Okay. Um, You're all set. Thank you very much. So, we, so, we, we, so we, we're looking at the relationship, not between halakha and truth, which would have been class three, but still the relationship between halakha and ethics. And just to give you a brief uh, synopsis of uh, what we already looked at a little bit at the end of last week. Um, there's Socrates over there, and Socrates uh, is, is uh, repudiated by, by Plato to have come up with the following dilemma. It's known as the Euthypro dilemma. Why does God love piety? Does God love good things because they're good? Or are they good because God loves them? Um, 
on the first option, God loves good things because they're good, you make it sound as if there is an ethical framework that's independent of God. And God, um, because he's good, he respects that framework, that framework outside of him. It constrains him because he's good. So he loves good things. He tries to respect this ethical framework that's external to him. That's one option. The other option is no, there's no, there's no ethical framework external to God. If we say that something's good, that just means God likes it. That's what makes it good. What makes something good is God liking it. Um, you know, one strange consequence of that second option is, you know, had God decided, so to speak, to like murder, then murder would have been good. Now, you might think that's not possible. You might think it's something about God's nature that makes it the case that God dislikes murder. Nonetheless, it's that God dislikes murder that makes it bad, and it's that God likes charity that makes it good, according to the second option of this dilemma. And we looked at two thinkers, uh, one halachically uh, Jewish and a uh, major uh, rabbinic thinker of, of, of this and in the, in, in the last century. Um, the other an ethnically Jewish, but I don't think he was halachically Jewish, uh, uh, analytical philosopher. Uh, as Sheba Mandel says, sometimes God does want murder. Certainly in the Jewish tradition, he is sometimes uh, recorded as ordering certain killings. But I would, I would um, urge that we make a distinction between uh, killing and murder. So there are some times when, um, um, let's say, if you believe in capital punishment, uh, you might say that there are times where the state should kill a person. The state will kill convicted murderers uh, who uh, have been sentenced with the death penalty. But we wouldn't necessarily call that murder, that's killing. So there are times when killing is sanctioned under Jewish law, for instance, in self-defense, but that would never be called murder. So it's not clear that God ever wants murder. Now, uh, you, could, you could ask about these very difficult cases genocidal cases, like in the book of Joshua, where God is, is presented as having commanded uh, all-out genocide. Um, maybe we'll get back to that issue in the, uh, in the question and answer set, you know, if, if we have time for questions and answers later on. But certainly, classically, uh, God isn't thought to want murder, even if he sometimes sanctions certain types of killing. And, and Rav Lichtenstein here, Rav Aaron Lichtenstein, uh, takes what I called the first horn of the dilemma. He says that there is an ethical system that to some extent or other can be separated from God such that you can, so to speak, hold God up to an external standard. And he learns this from, from the, the incident in the book of Genesis of Abraham and Sodom. God says, I'm going to destroy these towns uh, in the Jordan Valley. And Abraham says, um, Could the judge of all the earth not act justly? And, and in asking that rhetorical question, Abraham was holding God up to a standard external to God himself. Um, so, so this is what uh, Rav Aaron wrote in a classic paper that was republished in uh, the two volume set of Rav Lichtenstein's writings called Leaves of Faith. The paper in, in question is called, Is There an Ethic External to the Halakha? Uh, and I'll read it again, even though we read it at the end of last time. He writes, as Benjamin Witchcote, the 17th century Cambridge Platonist pointed out, one cannot ask, shall then the judge of the whole earth not do justice? unless one assumes the existence of an unlegislated justice to which, as it were, God himself is bound, and which, one might add, man can at least apprehend sufficiently to ask the question. So it, there are two things here. One, there must be such a thing as an ethic that's external to God, to which we can, we can hold God to account. And the second is, human beings must have some sort of knowledge of this ethic 
independently from their knowledge of God, because otherwise, how could Abraham even raise the question? It's as if Abraham's saying, look, I, not, I might not know much, God, but I do know some ethics even without you. And killing innocent people is not okay. And you shouldn't do bad things because you're supposed to be good. Or again, says Rav Lichtenstein, any attempt at rationalizing halacha, an endeavor already found in Chazal, although much more fully elaborated by the Rishonim, the medieval rabbis, it presupposes an axiological frame of reference, independent of halacha, in light of which it can be interpreted. In more plain English, the idea is if you are going about rationalizing halacha, saying, oh, I'll tell you why we have to build a sukkah, and I'll tell you why we're not allowed to eat chametz on Pesach, and I'll tell you why, and you give rationalizations, you imply that there's some sort of system of reason that's prior to the halacha, and that you have some sort of access to it, and you can explain why the halachot are reasonable, are right, are just, are ethical, uh, in terms of these ethical principles. Um, so Rav Lichtenstein seemingly uh, wants to take the side of the euthypro dilemma that says, there are some things which are just good, and there are some things which are bad, and it's not up to God what good is and what bad is, Part of what it means for God to be good is for him to act in accordance with uh, goodness. Uh, this kind of standard that, so to speak, is external to God. Although it's interesting that he does use that language, so to speak, because he, he recognizes that there's something controversial already in putting something external to God in that role of somehow constraining God. Which, which already points towards the sorts of tension that might lead you to the other side of the dilemma. And indeed, Ludwig Wittgenstein, the second thinker we looked at, um, and I mentioned him last week too, um, he came to the, the opposite conclusion. And he, he said, actually, it's more profound to accept that some things can't be explained. Every, every inquiry begins with some assumptions. Every system of thought has some axioms. And it's in terms of your axioms or assumptions that you're able to explain everything else. But at some point, inquiry has to end and there simply have to be some brute facts. Now, if you say, oh, I'll tell you why murder is bad, it's because God doesn't like it, um, you're basically accepting that there isn't anything deeper to say than that. You're basically accepting that you don't really have an explanation. And Wittgenstein thinks that's quite profound. Whereas if you say, oh, 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 no, 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 no. Murder's not just bad because God doesn't like it. Murder is independently bad because it's bad. It is if you're trying to explain something but you're trying to explain something that can't really be explained because you've already reached the kind of the, the, the ground floor of ethics. You can't go any deeper. So to use Wittgenstein's language, although like last time, he, 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 um, he calls what I called the second option, the first option. But anyway, on my view, the first interpretation is the deeper. That is good which God commands, meaning charity is good just because God commands it. Nothing more to say. Because this blocks off the road to any kind of explanation why it is good. If you say, no, charity is good, and that's why God commands it, you can still ask, yeah, but why is charity good? What makes charity good? Whereas as, um, the option that Wittgenstein prefers, uh, prefers is just to say, no, charity is just good because God says it is. Don't ask any more questions. Questions are good. We're philosophers. We like questions. But we also have to recognize that questions need to end somewhere. And we need to have the kind of wisdom to recognize when is it that our philosophizing has to end? Where, when is it that we've reached the ground floor? And for Wittgenstein, the will of God, Ratzon Hashem, is basically another way of saying we've reached the ground floor, right? So. Charity is good because God says it is. That's the ground floor. There's no more to be explained. 
murder's bad because God says it is. There's no, that's the ground floor. There's nothing more to be explained. Well, the second interpretation, the one that says, well, no, God commands us not to murder because murder's bad. God commands us to give charity because charity's good. That, that interpretation, according to Wittgenstein, is the shallow, rationalistic one in that it behaves as though that which is good could be given some further foundation. It makes it sound like you haven't yet reached the ground floor, but you have. Okay, so that's that's the uh, the dilemma, the youth and pro dilemma, and that's both sides of it. And we've seen um, a cautious defence of one side from Rav Lichtenstein because he does use this kind of language: "It's as if ethics, ethics is external to God," uh, and and a, a much more forthright endorsement of the other option uh, by Wittgenstein. And I'll just pause here if anyone has any questions to ask about the youth of pro dilemma and about the two sides. Uh, very nice. So Sabina asks about Kierkegaard's view that some questions can't be asked of God. Is that the same? Well, yes, I, I, I think they're, they're, they're in a, a similar family uh, of, of attitudes, Wittgenstein here and Kierkegaard uh, in various places, especially in his, Fear and his book Fear and Trembling on, on the Akedah, on the Binding of Isaac. Although Kierkegaard speaks about God being able to suspend the ethical. So, so God is above, is above ethics, um, which makes it sound like in day-to-day -day life, we do have ethics and we can talk about right and wrong independently of God. On the other hand, God trumps ethics. He kind of supersedes ethics. Uh, what's similar here is that Wittgenstein and Kierkegaard both accept that, that, that God is the trump card. Ultimately, you can't explain anything uh, uh, deeper. Once you've got to the will of God, there's no more questions to be asked. So in that regard, Wittgenstein and Kierkegaard are kind of in a, in a similar camp, but they differ in, in, in another regard, in that Wittgenstein doesn't think God could ask you to do anything unethical, because if God said murder, then it would be ethical to murder, because all we mean by being ethical is that, is that um, God commands it. Whereas as uh, Kierkegaard thinks that it makes sense for us to talk about ethical systems and then to talk about God being able to trump them. So there are differences and similarities. I see Nachum's hand went up virtually. So I'll, I'll hand over to Nachum. Yes, what would you like to ask? Thank you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Um, so why do ethics have to be independent of God? In other words, can't they be concomitant? That is, you know, unless I'm mistaken, the very view of, of Sajja Gaon is that all mitzvot are rational, some are revelational, you know, some are logical. Mm -hmm. um, but implicit is that ethics as part of that is within that totality. Good. And as I such, you know, why do we have to view them as independent as much as we could say in symmetry? Um, okay. Yeah, it's um, a great question. And I think, and I actually think that, um, you, I'm, I'm glad you ask it because it allows me, I think, to represent what I, I take Rav Aaron Lichtenstein's position really to have been. And that's, um, there isn't really an ethic that's external to God. I like your notion of concomitance. Um, I think the, the way that Wittgenstein wants to look at it, although you know Wittgenstein's theism is uh, perplexing because um, in, a, in a sense, in his later years, he thought that talking about God was just a type of a language game. It's not like he really believed in God in the way that um, Rav Wittgenstein did. But anyway, um, the way that Wittgenstein's talking here makes, makes you think that the ethical is somehow, it's almost like it's hardwired into God's nature. So it's not like God could have commanded differently because it's God's nature to like charity and hate murder. Um, and that, that's, a, that's a nice 
maybe that's a nice metaphor for explaining your notion of concomitance. They come together, God and ethics. Um, it's almost like when we do ethics, some people have thought when we do physics, for example, we are we're actually doing a type of divine psychology when we do physics, because what we're uncovering is the laws that God chose to run the world according to. Um, when you do ethics, you're likewise doing a, a, a type of, uh, it's, it's even deeper perhaps, you're doing a divine neurology. You're looking at the very structure of God's, uh, God's mind, such that he, he, couldn't, uh, he couldn't like murder. It goes against his very nature to like murder. So that's Wittgenstein's side. Now, fundamentally, I actually think that Rav Aaron agrees with Wittgenstein. However, his point is that we have two ways of accessing God's, God's nature. What, and this is, goes exactly back to Sajjika on, like you say, Nachum. One way of accessing e ethical truths is just through reason, because our own cognitive architecture is an image of God's cognitive architecture. We're made in the, in the image and likeness of God. We, we come to the world with very, very strong ethical intuitions. And we can use those to reason our way. And, and Rav Sajjah thought we could reason our way to all sorts of, um, of, of the mitzvot. We wouldn't have needed revelation to tell us not to murder, not to steal, to honor our parents, for example. And there are some mitzvot that we wouldn't have got to with reason alone, or it would have taken us a long time to, to say. And I actually think when, when Rav Lichtenstein says it's as if, it's, 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 it's as if you can hold God to account by this uh, independent um, um, system of ethics. I think what he really means is that we have independent access to ethics. We don't need God's revelation to know ethics. That doesn't mean they're really independent of God, and that's why he uses this language of as if. Ultimately, the reason ethical things are ethical is because they're, they're, they're hardwired into the nature of, of the ethical universe and they're hardwired, so to speak, to use a metaphor, in God's very own neurology, hardwired into God's own, you know, DNA. Um, however, um, we, ca we can talk as if there are laws which are external to God because that's how we experience them. We have access to some of these ethical truths independently of our access to God, independently of revelation. And that's what Abraham is doing when he turns around to God and says, Hashofet kol ha'aretz lo yasem ishpat. I know that you're supposed to be good, but I also have independent access to ethics and I know it's not okay to kill people. So like, explain yourself to me, God. Um, so yeah, I think at a fundamental level, Wittgenstein and Rav Aaron actually take the same side in Euthyphro's dilemma, which so is I'd say, I, I'd say it has to be almost because of Rav Lichtenstein's father-in-law, mm -hmm. <laughs> who so strongly believed, you know, in a rationale, but yes. in commandedness, and that commandedness. the reason. You know, the Rav says that we do certain things because we told is, to. You know, because of the commandedness. Right. Very much that's a piece of, you know, Yeshaya Leibowitz in terms of the commandedness, but it doesn't, I agree. you know, go against, you know, what you're. But it saying. doesn't go against using your mind to try and rationalize the mitzvot because we, because we have independent rational access to ethics. See, for that's me, right. though, the Rav is not so much this philosophical, well, it is philosophical, what I'm about to say, the approach, but when your notion could be a superficial, and it's not meant to be, comes into conflict with your reason or your emotion. Yes. And that is, we could be commanded by Shulchan Arach, you know, to keep two days Yom Tov in Israel as a diaspora Jew, mm -hmm. okay? We could be commanded that, you know, by Rav Moshe Feinstein. Um, those are the facts on the ground. But mm -hmm. for me, that fly, I mean, modestly, <laughs> it flies in the face of my emotion, my reason, whatever you want to call it. And, 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 and there are other instances like that. So when those things come into conflict, you know, yeah, that's, well, the, the, 
That's the really the real tough issue. times. The real tough times are when the halacha comes into conflict with with your strong ethical intuition, not just right. your emotion, right? Not just how I feel, but we'll hopefully we'll get there. So, um, the first thing that, that Rav Lichtenstein wants us to uh, um, be sensitive to in his essay about whether there's an ethic external to the halacha is what you might call the limitations of din. Din uh, is this Hebrew word, which in, the, in rabbinic literature connotes the strict application of justice. And there's a reason why I've used uh, this picture here on my slide of this blindfolded, um, this is a, a common image of justice, right? As, as, as a woman weighing up the, the, um, the the evidence on both sides of the case with a blindfold on. Why is justice always depicted as blind? And in fact, in the Jewish uh, tradition, in the mystical Jewish tradition, uh, Isaac of the three forefathers is said to represent strict justice, which is why he favored Esau over Jacob, because the strict application of justice is that Esau is the older of the two brothers. And Isaac was, both figuratively and literally blind, right? Um, um, he's the only one of the forefathers to have lost his sight like that. Um, now, the Gemara that Rav Lichtenstein alludes to in order to um, illustrate the limitations of the strict application of justice is this following fascinating Gemara from the Babylonian Talmud, Tractate Baba Metzia, 30b, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Locharavayu Shalayim, Jerusalem wasn't destroyed, Ella al Shadano Bad Din Torah, other than for the fact that there in Jerusalem they judged in accordance with Din Torah, the strict application of Torah law. And the Gemara can't believe that that's what Rabbi Yochanan said. Why, why was Jerusalem destroyed? Because they judged according to the law of the Torah? Well, what should they have done? And the Gemara asks uh, in tones of incredulity, Dine de, uh, de de dainu? what should they have done? Should they have judged according to the laws of the Megians? Right, of course they used Torah law, they were Jewish. That can't be what Rabbi Yochanan meant. Ella Ema, rather you should say this. If you want to understand what Rabbi Yochanan really meant, you should say this. They established their rulings according to the strict application of the law. The law of do, but they didn't, they didn't perform lifnim mishurat adin. Now this phrase is very, very important, lifnim mishurat hadin. It's translated idiomatically as beyond the letter of the law. So the reason Jerusalem was destroyed was because the rabbinic authorities in Jerusalem judged cases scrupulously according to the letter of the law, but they weren't willing to go beyond the letter of the law. And um, in actual fact, uh, I should point out that lifnim mishurat hadin, it doesn't actually mean beyond the letter of the law. It means, it really means something like within the lines of the law, which is a strange, a strange phrase to use to describe going beyond the letter of the law. Idiomatically, that's what it means. It means going beyond the letter of the law. But why this phrase, lifnim mishurat adin, which literally means to go within the line of the law, which you might, you know, if you took that literally, you might take that to mean, you know, a very strict application of the law that doesn't go beyond the letter. It enters into the letter. But the idea, and we'll come back to this idea, the idea is that no, when you go beyond the letter of the law, you very often get to the heart of what the law is actually about. So you've entered into the spirit of the law. 
So to go beyond the letter of the law is, in some instances, as we'll see, somehow to enter into, to penetrate into, the, the, as, as Beth Elstein says here in the chat, into the depths of the law. That's a very nice way of putting it. Um, so we'll come back to it. But the idea is, what this makes it, this makes it seem as if, uh, forget Euthyphro's question now, forget the, 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 the question of Socrates, is there an ethic external to God? Well, I agree with Wittgenstein and I think Rav Aaron and like uh, Nachum said, probably under the influence of his father-in-law, Rav Soloveitchik, I think they would all agree with me that um, the, the most profound response to the question, is there an ethic uh, external to God, is no that ultimately ethics bottoms out in God, that God is the foundation of ethics. There's a kind of concomitance, as Nachum said, between the will of God and the ethical. But the more interesting question is, is there an ethic external to halacha, right? And at, um, because the halacha, as, we've, as we learned in our last class, is a system of law that's created by humans in partnership with God, created by humans in response to the revelation. It's the will of God as understood in a particular time and place through the prism of human understanding. So there's always the, the potential that the halakha as we have it right now doesn't quite live up to what I called in the previous uh, 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 classes, the heavenly Torah. Um, Facebook says, I think it's important to distinguish moral epistemology with moral ontology. One could be a divine command ethicist and affirm rationality and intuition as epistemic tools in their morality. That's a very, very uh, um, neat way, but perhaps um, more verbose way of, of putting exactly what I was trying to express in terms of, of what Rav, Rav Aaron's position is. In terms of the ontology of ethics, what ethics really is, I think Rav Aaron was on the same side as Wittgenstein. That there, there, there is, from the point of ontology, um, no distinction between ethics and the will of God. Um, but from the point of epistemology, from the point of how we come to know things, we have two very different ways of coming to know things. There's revelation and there's moral intuition and ethics and reason and rationality. Um, that's absolutely right. Um, but here we have the question, um, a different question now. It's kind of the youth of pro dilemma applied to halakha rather than to God. It says at any given time in history, you have this thing called halakha. Is there an ethic external to that? And this, um, this Gemara, at least in isolation, this statement of Rav Yochanan, that Jerusalem was destroyed because they applied a strict interpretation of the law to every case that came to them, seems to indicate that fastidious, fastidious observance of Jewish law can, can be destructive and, and ethically corrosive and can create a society worthy of destruction. Um, in fact, in the same uh, context, the Maharal of Prague, in his commentary on the Agadita, uh, of, uh, on the kind of more folkloric passages of the Talmud, um, on this passage, he explains why the Torah was given in a desert. He says, the Torah was given in a desert to remind you that if you live only according to the Torah, to the letter of the law, you will bring destruction upon yourself because the desert is a place of destruction. Only if you go beyond the letter of the law um, will, will you live in a place that flourishes. Will you be able, so to speak, to live in a place that isn't desertified? Um, does that acknowledge the ambiguity of language and knowledge? Yes, Sabina, I think Rav, Rav Lichtenstein's point is, and, and this was the whole idea of, of Avraham as well, asking that question, is that we know that God is good, but we sometimes don't understand uh, how what he's doing can be considered good. Um, and 
we have access to ethics through our intuition and reason, but we also recognize that we can be wrong. Our intuitions and our reasons can lead us uh, astray. Okay, so I'm gonna carry on now to the next slide. So the question is, is DIN, the strict application of Jewish law, all that there is to halakha? Or is halakha a broader, a broader notion than the notion that we've called DIN? And um, this is what Rav Lichtenstein had to say to that. He asks, just how independent of the halakha is the ethic that ennobles us above the scoundrel with Torah license. Now, let me take that quote away for a minute and explain something. Um, and I'll come back to this question about the death penalty uh, later on. Um, but remind me to come back to the question of the death penalty later on if, if I forget. Um, there is a commandment in the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, that says, you shall be holy, kadoshim to you. And it's understood by the rabbis to be a commandment to be holy. And Nachmanides asks famously a question on this commandment. He says, why was it necessary? Why was it necessary for there to be a law to be holy? Because surely if we kept all of the other laws, we'd be holy automatically. So why was there the need for this extra law? And part of the, of the answer that Nachmanides gives is that it's actually possible to be what he calls a naval bishut ha-Torah, which Rav Lichtenstein describes as a scoundrel with the Torah's license. So yeah, you only eat kosher food, but you're a glutton, right? And yes, you only give, you know, you, you, you give a tenth of your earnings to, to tzedakah, but you do it begrudgingly and, and my, in, in the most miserly way you can, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you can be um, a scoundrel, so to speak, with the license of the Torah. And it's because of that that the Torah had to go one step further and say, oh, in addition to keeping all of the laws, can you also try and be holy? Can you try and be nice people? So then Rav Lichtenstein says, well, well, how can you try to be noble, more noble than the scoundrel with Torah license? Um, surely you have to do that in conversation with something called ethics, right? Well, how independent of halakha is that ethic? How, mm. so to use his language, how independent of halakha is the ethic that ennobles us above the scoundrel with Torah license? And he answers, well, it depends what you mean by the word halakha. If we regard din and halakha as coextensive, if they're the same thing, then very independent. Because as we've seen, Jerusalem was destroyed because of its fastidious attention to din without going beyond the letter of the law. As we've seen from Nachmanides, you can be a scoundrel within the precepts of din. So if halakha just means din, if halakha is just a legal code that needs to be strictly applied to every situation, then the ethic that we are called upon to, to live up to in order that Jerusalem shouldn't be destroyed, in order that we should rise above the scoundrel with Torah license, that ethic is going to be very independent of halakha. I'll, I'll take questions and comments in a minute. If, however, we recognize that halakha is multiplanar and many dimensional, that, properly conceived, it includes much more than is explicitly required or permitted by specific rules, then we shall realize that the ethical moment we are seeking is itself an aspect of halakha. Don't forget, after all, that the commandment to be holy is a commandment. Right? It's part of the Torah. So the demand, or if you will, the impetus for transcending the din is itself part 
of the halachic corpus. I see some um, some notion. Uh, uh, oh, so uh, uh, menschlichkeit. That's right. There's this notion of menschlichkeit or derech eretz. Derech eretz kadma the Torah. It precedes the Torah that we are called upon to embody in our lives. And it goes much further than din. The question is, what is menschlichkeit? What is derech eretz? What is this, this ethic that goes beyond din? And is it independent of halacha? Now, ultimately, Rav Lichtenstein says, well, it just depends upon what you mean by halacha. You could talk about halacha with a capital H and halacha with a lowercase h. Halacha with a lowercase h is just din. And then, of course, there's an ethic external to it. And, and sometimes the right thing to do is to supersede din, to go further than one, what din asks of you. Uh, but you can also think of halacha with a, an uppercase H. And halacha with an uppercase H includes within it the imperative to go beyond din. Humanity, the better angel, derech eretz, common sense. We have, you know, a number of names for this, uh, this extra thing. Lifnim, yeshurat ad-din. Um, and in fact, um, Though the Ramban Nachmanides, he says uh, that the the mission, the mitzvah to be kadoshim to you, the mitzvah to be holy, is a mitzvah to be ethical. In some people's count of the six hundred and thirteen commandments, there is actually a commandment to go beyond the letter of the law, um, which is kind of paradoxical, because you can't. Because if one of the laws is to go beyond the letter of the law, then when you go beyond the letter of the law, you're not going beyond the letter of the law. So there's kind of an internal paradox here. Um, but there is a verse um, in the book of Exodus, in Sefer Shemot, chapter 18, verse 20. It says, <laughs> You should enjoin upon the Jewish people the laws and the teachings and make known to them the way they are to walk within and the practice which they should practice. And a very, very early Midrash, the Mechilta, um, which is uh, uh, part of, of what's known as the Halachic Midrash, the, 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 some of the more famous Midrashim are narrative Midrashim, which tell stories. The halachic midrashim, their main aim is to squeeze halachot, Jewish laws, out of the verses of the, the Torah. Uh, Sheba Mandel asks beautifully, didn't Aaron's sons die for going beyond the letter of the law? It's a brilliant question. I'll try to come back to it in a moment. Um, I'm glad you asked. Um, but this is what... This is what the Mechilta says um, about this verse. Rabbi Elazar Hamodai, uh, Hamodai, sorry. So Rabbi Elazar from Modain, he said, What does it mean when it says you shall inform them? It means, which means something like you should inform them of their life's cause, course, sorry. You should tell them the things they need to, to know in order to live um, a, a life in which they flourish, something like that. What does it mean? Et haderech, the way. Zu gemilut chasadim. That refers to acts of kindness. Yelchu, what does it mean? Uh, that they shall go in. Yelchu, what does that refer to? Ze pikur cholim. That refers to visiting the sick. Ba, they should walk in it. In what? Zuk vurat metim. This teaches us that we are supposed to bury the dead. Viet hamaaseh, right? Make known to them the practices. What practices? Zehadin. This is the strict application of Jewish law. Asheh asun, which they should practice. Zeh lifnim mishuet adin. This is the Torah commanding us to go lifnim meshurat adin. And indeed, 
citing uh, this mechilta, the smack, which sounds like a, um, a violent name for a book, but it stands for Sefer Mitzvah Katan, right? The, the, book, the small book of mitzvot, which lists, which is one of the medieval listings of the 613 commandments. Um, it lists as one of the 613, to go beyond the letter of the law. How, why, how do we know that? It takes our verse from the book of Exodus and learns that verse as the Mechilta had learned it, which means the practices they should practice. The practices refers to the din, which they should practice refers to Lifnim Mishurat Adin. And he also quotes um, our Gemara from Baba Metzia, the Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Lo nechrevayu shalayim al shadanu badin Torah, the only reason Jerusalem was destroyed was because they, um, they executed strict justice there. Now the Talmud asked in shock, what should they have judged by the laws of the Magians? No, Ella al shahamidu divrehem al din Torah v'lo asulif nim adin. The problem was they stood all their rulings up uh, within strict justice and didn't go beyond the letter of the law. Um, I, I, I really, don't want to forget this question about uh, Nadav and Avihu, and I also don't want to forget the question about um, the death penalty. But before um, I get there, goodness, time keeps flying in this class. Um, there's a reason why I have this Escher drawing here, uh, of the hand drawing itself, because there is something paradoxical about a legal system commanding within it people going beyond it, because then you can't, because if you go beyond it, you're doing what it's telling you to do. But that's why uh, I included that picture there. But Rav Aaron asks two really important questions. First, if Lifnim Meshur Tadin, going beyond the letter of the law, is indeed obligatory as an integral aspect of halacha, then in what sense is it super, uh, super illegal? In what sense is it, is it really external to the law? M more specifically on the Rav Yaz view, Right, the Rav Yah says that sometimes the Rav Yah is a is a medieval commentator on the Talmud that Rav Aaron quotes in his book. He says the Rav Yah says sometimes the Bet Din is even allowed to force people, compel people to go beyond the letter of the law. Sometimes yes, but sometimes no. Sometimes you can't do that. And Rav Aaron asks, well, if you go, if you if you think like that. How can you know? When, when is it compulsory so that you can actually, you can actually compel people to go beyond the letter of the law? And when is it optional? And, and how is it separate from the law if the law itself commands it? That's the first question. And his answer is as follows. Only direct ad hoc judgment, usually, although this is logically a wholly separate question, his own, can serve as an operative basis for decision. Between ultimate value and immediate issue, there can be no other midwife. This is a very, very eloquent way of, um, of expressing the point. But the point is this, There's a, and, and, and it's already there in the Ramban's commentary to, to Leviticus 19. The point is this, a legal system cannot legislate for every eventuality. But there are two reasons for this. One reason is because there are too many eventualities. There are an infinite number of possible situations. So no finite legal system can have written down a law for every eventuality. But the thing about Menschlichkeit is that it also can't always be codified. Um, there's a, there's a, a beautiful um, expression that, that um, the the ethical philosopher Bernard Williams brought into um, uh, ethics. It's called uh, the, the one thought too many argument. One thought too many argument. He imagines the following. He imagines he's on a, on a lifeboat after a catastrophe at sea. And there are various people trying to get into the lifeboat, some strangers and his wife. And he decides to save his wife. And his wife gets in 
And she says, my darling, thank you so much for saving my life. That must have been a tough decision when there were so many people to save and you reached out for me. Tell me, why did you do that? And he says, well, um, I thought it through carefully and I recognize that according to the Kantian categorical imperative, it is okay for a man to privilege his wife over others because if everybody did that, people would be okay generally. And I thought about it from a utilitarian perspective and I recognize that a rule utilitarian perspective might allow me to, and by this time his wife slaps him in the face and says, I thought you did it because you love me, right? You know, um, sometimes you can have a thought too many. Sometimes, the ethical gesture is, is um, I don't, I'm not searching for the right word, but the ethical gesture is somehow undermined by its being formulated sometimes. Uh, it's a more existential, psychological, in the moment type of thing. And that's why there needs to be a notion of going listening in Mishra Tadin, not just because, um, you know, you'd need an infinitely long law book, but because also some things just, they, they can't be written. To write them down already is to do a certain sort of uh, um, injustice to them. And, and therefore, these sorts of decisions have to be ad hoc. Right, they have to be in the moment by their very nature. Then his second question is, isn't this exposition, what I've just said, a mere sham? Having conceded in effect the inadequacy of the halachic ethic, it implicitly re recognizes the need for a compliment, right, it says you have to go lift nim meshurit adin, only to attempt to neutralize this admission by claiming that the compliment itself has actually been a part of halakha all along, so that the fiction of halakhic comprehensiveness can be saved after all. But the upshot of this, this is, this is a beautiful word, ledger domain, which means sleight of hand. The upshot of this sleight of hand does not differ in substance from the view that the tradition does recognize an ethic independent of halakha. So why not state it openly? Why make this subtle distinction between a halakha with a small h and halakha with a big h, just be open and honest and admit there's more to ethics than halakha. Uh, sorry, but, um, let me finish the slideshow, that's the end of the slides. Um, but I think Rav Littensing thinks it's more than a sleight of hand because, um, well, for a number of reasons. One is, that when we invoke meta-halachic principles in order to be more lenient than we normally would, would be, or sometimes in order to be more stringent than we normally would be, okay? Um, so for, for instance, uh, Rav, Rav Soloveitchik ruled because he was very, very worried about at a per, per certain time in American Jewish history of an exodus of young Orthodox Jews to the conservative movement. And at that time, he said, um, if it's Rosh Hashanah and the only synagogue in town is a conservative synagogue, and it's the only place you can go to hear the chauffeur, you shouldn't go. And it's not clear to me, I'm not an expert in any of the halachot or whatever, it's not clear to me he would say that, he would have said that today because Orthodoxy isn't under the same sort of threat, I don't think, from the conservative movement as it was at the particular time that he said it. So there was a, a meta-halachic consideration that was influencing his psak. There are other times, um, like the briskarav, uh, we spoke about the woman who came and said, is my chicken kosher? And he said, well, first of all, I want to know how many chickens do you have? Clearly, there was some sort of... Um, value of compassion, compassion for the poor, compassion um, for this, you know, for this woman in this particular instance that, that would have pushed him towards um, leniency if he possibly could be lenient. Um, these values, it would, it would be unfair to the halakha to say they're completely external because 
Her ways are ways of pleasantness and all the paths of peace. That's also part of the Torah. It's not like it isn't. When, you know, and, and, and Rabbi Soloveitchik's concern for, for um, the, um, what he took to be the kind of demographic uh, um, um, security of the community that he was leading um, he could also ground in the Torah. And I think that that is part of why we, we say lifnim mishur tadin. It's not about going to a totally alien ethic. It's not like saying, oh, uh, this halakha is in conflict with Kant, what can I do? Or this halakha is in, content with con in conflict with utilitarianism, what should I do? It's this halakha, this strict application of din, is in conflict with greater meta-halachic principles. They are also part of the system and a great posek, a great decisor of Jewish law, and also us in our own daily lives. We have to decide um, when is it appropriate to privilege the meta principles above the strict application and when is it not uh, acceptable to, uh, to do so. And we could add, though I don't think Rav Lichtenstein would talk in this way, the notion that we've already got from our previous talks about halakha as an evolving system as well. Once we recognize, and this comes back to the death penalty question, um, a plain reading of the, of the five books of Moses looks like God is rather keen on the death penalty, uh, but, uh, but a reading of rabbinic literature makes it look like the death penalty is a terrible, terrible thing that is very rarely, if ever, enacted. Now, if you believe in the principle of Judaism that I laid out in class Two, towards the beginning of class two, that the, the, the evolving literature of the Jewish people over time is an expression of the will of God, um, then even when it looks like alien ethical principles, once they've entered the Jewish mainstream and become part of the consensus, there's good grounds to think, well, that also has the imprimatur of Sinai now. That's now part of Judaism. And perhaps we are now closer uh, rather than further away from the heavenly Torah because of uh, the adoption of even what looked like alien ethical um, imperatives, not just the sorts of meta-halachic imperatives that uh, Rav Lichtenstein was talking about. That is, once they've been accepted um, by the, the kind of body politic of the faithful of, of Israel, or at least the, commun the faithful community to which uh, you belong. Finally, um, the Nadav and Avihu question, it's fabulous. There are cases where people are, seem to be punished for uh, an excess uh, of religious devotion. But I would just point out the salient difference. Nobody was ever punished in Jewish law, in Jewish history, for being too kind. No one was ever punished in Jewish history for being too just. Sometimes people are told to give less to charity but only because it's being unkind to their own family and children for them to give more, not because you're being too kind, right? That area of Jewish law is called ben adam lechavira, right? Between a person and his, and, and his friend, a person, you know, between people, interpersonal law. That's where lifnim meshurat adin, that's where we are commanded to go beyond the letter of the law. Nadav and Avihu, tried to bring a sacrifice in the temple that they hadn't been commanded to bring. In Judaism, you, uh, you're never really criticized for being too ethical, but you can be criticized sometimes for being too religious, right? That's in, in, the, in the realm of Ben Adam Lamakom, between a person and God. And in, in that particular episode, I think that the lasting lesson that the Torah is trying to teach us is that there is a type of burning fanaticism in religious devotion that can lead people astray, that can pervert things, that can be so fiery that people end up dead. That's bad. But ethical fanaticism, uh, when it's not religious fanaticism, uh, is perhaps uh, um, a, a greater thing to aspire towards. The other lesson I think that we get from Nadav and Avihu is that there is a danger in coming too close to God. We have to recognize that, um, that God lies always beyond um, our clear and distinct perception. We're aware of God. We can even have vivid 
religious experiences, but we recognize uh, that there's always more about God that we don't know than that we do. Nadav and Avihu, so to speak, got too close. But I don't think in the final analysis that that is a contradiction to what we've been talking about today, which is going beyond the letter of the law. Uh, Wendy Baker asks, ethical ev evolution meant there has to be change over time. So new understandings for behavior or other techniques that could be less brutal to keep society essentially above uh, to live with itself. That's right. Uh, the, 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 the Bible was, was revealed, even if you're you know, very, very from and you really believe in your revelation. And I, I do. I'm really quite from, I must say. I, you know, I, I describe myself that way. But um, um, if, you believe, in, if you, you believe in revelation, you can still accept that the Bible was initially revealed to, to a primitive time and place and to, to people who were culturally, uh, ethically, um, and in some ways intellectually, inferior to us, which is something you don't hear many Orthodox people talking about because of this notion of Yuridata Darot, Yuridata Darot, of the, 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 um, the generations um, descending in their stature. Well, yes, we're descending in our stature. I can even believe that. But, but we, thank God, we might be dwarfs, but we're standing on the shoulders of giants. We come many, many centuries after uh, Sinai. So there are many things we know uh, that they couldn't have understood or been expected to enforce. Um, so yes, ethical evolution is part of the halachic system. I see there's one question, uh, one hand up just before I, I turn to that. I'll just say to wrap up the entire series, the, the, the three classes, which were really two, is that um, I, I, I wanted to use philosophy to resolve a certain tension within the halacha in the first um, in the first class, and that tension was to do with pluralism and faithfulness between fidelity to revelation and creativity. And in the second class, I wanted to give us a broader uh, understanding of what halakha is, because we often think of halakha as, you know, uh, you've got to be kosher for Pesach, you've got to make sure, uh, you know, that you've washed your dishes in a certain way, you've got to make sure that you've uh, lit your candles or put your tefillin on in a certain way, and those things are important. Um, and they are part of the body of the halakha. Um, but I wanted to recognize that they're also values and perhaps a growing collection of values that are supposed to animate the halakha. Um, and they too, when we speak about the halakha with a capital H, they should be recognized uh, as part of what we mean when we talk about halakha. And uh, they should enter into the discussion of the philosophy of halakha. So that's, that's it from me, uh, Nachum. So, am I unmuted? So some things you're calling meta-halacha, mm -hmm. and I think that belies, or I'll use a strong word, obscures um, a critical question. And that is, yes, you know, probably there are some things that are meta, um, that really come into conflict, mm -hmm. but there are many things that you hear me because you see yeah, yeah, yeah. oh no now you're frozen oh shame are you there yeah you're yeah here now yeah here now okay so you're using the word you know in sometimes meta and i'm saying that belies or almost um eliminates Obscures. you know when there really are fundamental different approaches. Okay, so, um, so let me... So, let me I mean, just let, take, you know, I, I could go on and on, but I'm yeah. not, you know, as I said, I'll save it for another time. Very different approaches that both individuals considered halachic, like David Hartman, you know, mm -hmm. and Rav Salavechik. Mm -hmm. I mean, David well, Hartman was... Well, look, we, we did speak last time about pluralism with, within halakha. There are certain issues right. upon which there is not yet a consensus within the world of people that take halakha seriously. So the halakha, so to speak, hasn't made a decision, even though the Rav of Soloveitchik might have felt very strongly that it should go that way, and, and Hartman felt very strongly it should go that way. Maybe, maybe that in a sense they were both wrong because it's still up in the air, right? Because it's, some, of these, some of these things are yet to be decided. But in, in response to your actual question, and I, and I think I, I can make my life even harder um, by unpacking the question. 
First of all, I wanted to make a distinction between meta-halachic principles and what I was calling alien principles. Okay. Rav okay. Lichtenstein is only talking in his article about meta-halachic principles. And what that means is, meta is probably the wrong word. It, it's almost like un, underneath, it's foundational halachic principles. Rav, Rav Lichtenstein thought there's a certain ethos that, is, that can be found exclusively in the halachic texts and sometimes a particular application of a law runs counter to one of those values which can also be found in the law. And it's in those cases where perhaps you need to go lift nim mishur tadin, go beyond the letter of the law in the service of a value, but that value is also part of the law. That's what, and it's those conflicts that I would call, uh, or those principles that sometimes come in conflict with um, with law, I would call them meta-halachic. What do I mean by alien? Well, think about, um, think about feminism, okay? Um, there were meta-halachic principles like kavod abriyot, like, you know, you know, care for the dignity of humanity, the notion of tselem elokim, everybody, man and woman, being made in the image of God. There were various values in the, um, in, in the body of the halachic system that, that um, you know, that could be, could be adopted in, you know, to advance the cause of feminism. But the basic notion um, that women, for example, um, can have a, a public role, uh, uh, leadership roles, um, uh, roles within scholarship, um, the, the basic, the basic uh, construal of a woman as being in no way disqualified from public office, because it seems like the, the rabbis had a notion that, uh, that, that the woman's place, in a, in a sense, was not public uh, and was not in roles of leadership, although they had great respect for, for, for certain women. Um, and the rights of the agunot, the rights of, ch of chained women, um, the scholarship of Bruria, they had respect for certain women. Um, but the, the, the notion that a woman could function as an equal to a man in civic spaces, in public office, was alien, I would say, to Fully the- Fully human. To, pardon? Fully human. Fully human. Well, I don't want to go that far. I don't think the notion of their full humanity was alien to Judaism because the verse says quite clearly that, that he created them in the image of God. Male and female, he created them. But I didn't so, set out treating them that way. Yeah, I agree with you. But my point is that I think that the rabbis, they, they had a notion of female humanity. They didn't have a notion of female citizenship. They didn't have a role of, of, of women being uh, on a par to men in the civil space. And I think that there was a, there was a major um, culture conflict, you could put it, between the halachic system and the feminism of the West. And I don't think that Rav Lichtenstein's analysis of that conflict would be able to run in terms of, oh, we've got the lifnim mashur tadin, we've got the meta-halachic principles. There were no meta-halachic principles saying women should be citizens, I don't think. What I think happened in that case was there was an ethical awakening. A great many people had strong, strong conviction that, you know what, for all these generations, the rabbis were just wrong yeah. about this. We, you know, women really can be equal citizens, not just equal humans, equal citizens. And what it took was, uh, th this, this is my own view, it took the feminist movement first, then it took reform and conservative Judaism to start opening up spaces for women before it, become, before it became untenable for certain orthodox institutions not to open their doors to female scholarship, to female leadership roles, and I, I thank God that it happened. I see that as part of an ongoing revelation, right? Um, but it only became clear that that was part of the revelation once enough Jews had adopted it, right? Um, 
because there's this idea, like I said, that the halachic system evolves in conversation with, uh, with the evolving, you know, the, the, the halacha evolves, it, it, it evolves over time. My, my basic point um, has been in this lecture, in this class, that there are two, there are two times in which the halacha can come in conflict with an ethical principle. Sometimes the application of the halakha can come in conflict with one of the halakha, well, with one of the halakhic system's own values. And in those cases, it's, it, it, it's quite easy and common to just say, oh, well, go beyond the letter of the law. There are other times when the halakhic system finds itself in conflict with alien values, the alien values that become dear to the Jewish people because of their own ethical insight and intuitions. And those are much harder conflicts to resolve. Feminism was one of them, and orthodoxy's moved a long way on that. But take it, take uh, gender and sexuality today. Um, there are real major conflicts between people whose entire identity around their sexual orientation or, 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 or around their, 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 their gender ascription, their gender identity, is in conflict with the, the, the heteronormative halachic system of, of orthodox Judaism. And there will be a reckoning. Either um, the liberal wing of orthodoxy will come up with a modus operandi in which certain people who haven't yet felt comfortable in our communities will become comfortable and then the facts on the ground will change. Or um, they won't, right? And, and, you know, and it will turn out that no, orthodoxy stays a heteronormative, uh, you know, and that and that egalitarian halakhic Judaism was a flash in the pan. We, we will have to wait and see. Like Benjamin Summer said, if you're, in the if you're alive in the time of Sad the Sadducees, no one could know whether the Sadducees or the Pharisees would win. And therefore no one could know whether the Sadducees were Torah or not Torah. Turns out they weren't Torah, right? Uh, um, but, but at the time you could say, So those are the, those are the, those are the halachic ethical gray areas in which we still live and we have to make our own personal decisions. Is this something you want to fight for, this particular issue, because you feel so strongly ethically? And if so, perhaps your role in the Jewish people is um, to showcase a different way of living, or is your role in the Jewish people to be a kind of conservative um, filter because I do think the conservative wing of Judaism, by saying no, 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 every time any uh, uh, specter of change is, is raised, they also play a role. They play a role in filtering things out that, that, that may turn out just to be fads or passing phases. The things that survive are the things which have the imprimatur of Sinai. Um, and we all have a role to play in this ongoing um, battle of wills, this evolving re revelation that takes place within our fractious community. Anyway, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Dr. Levens, for this wonderful series. And thank you everyone who joined us today on Zoom, on Drisha Live, and on Facebook. I wanted to let everyone know that uh, applications are now open for uh, Drisha's Summer Kolel which is taking place across uh, two three-week sessions from May 31st until July 9th. And there are both full-time and part-time options available. The theme this year is universalism and particularism in Jewish tradition. And you can find out more details um, about all of this at uh, www.drisha.org slash summerkolel. We also continue our spring program, not fall, <laughs> this evening at uh, 8 p.m. with a class on what is halacha, the fascinating uh, history of an essential term with Rabbi Zokir. And in addition, we always have many more classes uh, and programs happening. So uh, you can find out more information as well as the registration links on our website at www.drisha.org slash classes. Or you can watch live, uh, you can watch classes live and also recorded classes on uh, www.drisha.org slash live.